better? Yes, excellent. Um, yeah, last uh, speaker be between you and beer, so okay, let's get cracking. Uh, my name is Harald Kouter, uh, and I'm going to talk to you about the work that my colleague Des Small, who is also in the room, and I are doing uh, with Erlang in radio astronomy. Let's see if this works. Yes, it does. Uh, we both work at the Joint Institute for Field Behind Europe, which is located in Greenlow, in the northern part of the Netherlands, some 400 miles away from where we are now, according to Google. Um, the Joint Institute for VLBI has an acronym in its name, VLBI, which is short for Very Long Baseline Interferometry. VLBI is a radio astronomical observation technique and because our institute is not made out of computer science or mathematics, I would like to introduce a bit for it so you know where we're coming from. Um, astronomers have been building larger telescopes ever since Sir Isaac Newton built this small uh, uh, piece. And current day telescopes go up to 5 meters, 10 meters, or sometimes even up to 100 meters. Uh, so why is that? If you take a small telescope and you look through it, you might see this. Build a larger one and you'll see this. That's basically one of the main reasons. Um, is the size of the telescope the only interesting variable? Unfortunately not. Uh, astronomers observe the universe by detecting electromagnetic radiation uh, from gamma rays through visible light and radio waves. And they're all basically the same phenomenon, differing only in one key property, namely the wavelength. And as you can see, there's a huge uh, uh, difference in wavelength between gamma rays, visible light, and radio waves. Um, so I've got a pop quiz for you. Uh, who do you think will see the most details? An amateur astronomer using a 20 centimeter optical telescope or a professional radio astronomer with a whopping 100 meter uh, radio telescope. Can I see a show of hands? Who thinks that the amateur astronomer will see more details? <laughs> <laughs> the universe, not the neighbor. <laughs> um, okay, anyone thinks that the professional radio astronomer will see more details? Okay, it's, uh, there's more people who think that that is. Unfortunately, it is the uh, amateur radio astronomer who wins this by a factor of thousand even. Uh, and the big difference is uh, the observed wavelength. There's about a uh, 10 to the 6 difference in observed wavelength. And uh, there, is, there is a measure called wavelength over diameter, which is a measure of how big your pixels are that you can see with the telescope. And the smaller your pixels, the more details you can see. And the, despite the fact that the amateur astronomer has a telescope which is about a thousand times smaller than the radio telescope, the fact that the wavelength is even much smaller than that, they still win. Is this the end for uh, radio astronomy then? Fortunately not. There is a neat trick that we can play. Suppose we have a telescope of 100 meters, we want to build one of that. But rather than building one of 100 meters, we take two smaller telescopes, say 20 meters in diameter, but we place them 100 meters apart. If we then take the individual signals of the telescope <coughs> and combine them through the process which we call correlation, then the output data set has a resolution which is equal to that of a telescope with a size equal to the distance between the two telescopes, so 100 meter in this case. In VLBI we take this trick to another level, we use radio telescopes on different continents, we take the signals and bring them together in a correlator and in that way we create a telescope which is nearly or a maximum size nearly as large as the Earth itself. So it's a completely different ball game now. If we now compare the largest optical telescope, which operates in the infrared, unfortunately, 
and we take, say, the lowest uh, resolution global VLBI configuration, then, despite the wavelength difference still being large, our diameter, because we have now a telescope the size of the Earth, we win by a factor of 100 in the radio. So what can you do with a telescope that can see that many details? For example, uh, we can see individual stars exploding in neighboring galaxies. And if you observe a faraway stable source, then uh, you can actually watch the continents drift. Uh, with using VLBI, it is possible to measure the distance between two telescopes on Earth to sub-millimeter precision, uh, even though they're, in this case, some 6,000 kilometers apart. Uh, in this plot, we show the distance between a telescope in the United States and one in Germany, and you can see over time the distance is increasing by roughly 17 millimeters per year. So the United States and the European continent, they're drifting apart. Another thing is that if an earthquake happens, you can immediately measure how far the continent has been displaced, in this case some 10 millimeters. And finally, if you thought that the Earth was rotating at a steady 24 hour, with a steady 24 hour period, then think again. If you start measuring the uh, rotation speed of the Earth with sub millimeter second precision, then you will notice that the uh, periodicities occur at different uh, intervals, and there's even a sort of trending. Uh, effect to be seen. And in fact, the fact that the Earth is rotating rather slower than exactly 24 hours, this is the root cause of the uh, leap seconds that we see. Because in this case, somewhere in 1973, the Earth was rotating by about 3 milliseconds per day slower than normal. And if you accumulate that, 3 milliseconds per day over 365 days, you've accumulated about a second's worth of difference. So that's when you have leap seconds. Um, as I said, in order to bring the data from the telescopes together, we have to, re uh, have to record them on hard disks. And these hard disks will be shipped to our central facility in the Netherlands. Uh, we have to use special equipment in order to keep up with the data rate of a gigabit per second or up to four gigabits per second that a single telescope can generate. Since 2007, we have been starting to do these things in real time. Uh, data is uh, sent from the telescope over high bandwidth global network links straight into our facility in the Netherlands. This is a network throughput plot of one of our real-time observations. And you can see over here that after an initial setup test at very low bandwidth, uh, we are receiving more than eight gigabits per second for several hours from telescopes distributed across Europe, uh, South Africa, and China. And all this data is being processed in real time. So, um, as the computational requirements to uh, go up as n squared, if you want to compute all combinations between all participating telescopes, um, we need special hardware to do that. And it's called a correlator. This is our Mark IV correlator. It is built with 1990s technology, and it's operating 1,024 of these custom-built chips which are working in parallel. By comparison, uh, a current day, our current day 256 node 3 gigahertz Xeon cluster can barely do half of what this machine can do. But we want to correlate more stations, more than 16, and we want to correlate more bits per second. So we need more, a better correlator. So that's why an international consortium of radio astronomical observatories have developed the UNIBOARD. The UNIBOARD is an FPGA-based signal processing platform. It is uh, 
equipped with eight state-of-the-art FPGAs, but conceptually divided into front nodes and back nodes. The idea is that data will come in into the front nodes, it can be pre-processed a bit, then sent off to the back nodes, process some more before it leaves the board again. Um, between them, the four front nodes have 160 gigabits per second of input bandwidth. The output, uh, the back nodes have the same at the output. And every front node is connected to all other back nodes with better than 20 gigabit per second links. And finally, each FPGA <coughs> is connected to the outside world uh, via a one gigabit per second link uh, and an onboard Ethernet switch. And actually, this is the piece of equipment that we really want to command and control using airline. This was our main driver for it. So, airline. Our institute is a primarily a C++ institute because of performance reasons. We do use uh, other languages, of course. But um, in order to uh, do something with airline, we had to do some serious management uh, convincing because we have not the luxury to build instruments just out of uh, academic interest. So we were allowed to do a pilot project. Um, it is a fact that in uh, VLBI data is stored in several different but framed data formats and the, uh, so each frame is typically consists of a header with a binary data payload. Within the header, you typically find a specific bit pattern that software or hardware can synchronize on, and there will be a timestamp in there uh, describing the time of the data. So I decided to write a simple, uh, see if I can write a simple decoding utility that you could give the file, and it would attempt to identify and display some information about what data it was looking at. So for one of the formats, the synchronizing bit pattern looks like this, and for another format, the synchronizing bit pattern could look like this. And sure enough, in about a week, the words of coding, and well, I wrote to 12, but actually it is a bit more, 240 lines of code, I managed to um, create a simple system that would actually de recognize and decode the three available formats, uh, decoded the binary coded decimal timestamps that are in the headers, and it even did some, just to experiment with it, some uh, distributed features where the data file reading could be done on one node, and the actual interpretation and decoding of the data would be done on another node. And the fact that we could do this in just a few, 200 to uh, lines of code so, uh, really impressed management. So at that time, my colleague Des and I, we were uh, granted to do another uh, more serious pilot project. As I said, we do these things in real time and we want to have a website displaying some soft real-time information about the running experiment. One of the things is the webcams. Because typically these webcams are at remote locations with large latencies and lo low bandwidth. So if we start, uh, if our users of our web page uh, start looking at it, we can very easily hammer those devices. Uh, so we want to cache the images locally. And at the same time, we don't want to, uh, because of the, the link quality not being so good, <coughs> we don't want to show half images. At the same time, during the observation, a, uh, the telescope control system emits all kinds of useful information that we want to make uh, plots of uh, in, in, in time. time series. So we come up with a, a webcam monitoring utility uh, which takes uh, some metadata from the MySQL, MySQL database and pulls the uh, webcams at a low rate, say once per minute, uh, uses a port into uh, ImageMagic to 
create a scaled down version of the webcam image and uh, stores the binary data straight into Nisia. Uh, the uh, log file parsing uh, application ran in a different node. It is a bit, uh, it's a low data rate application. It gets its data, its data from the telescope using Python and SSH. The data gets parsed and updated into a MySQL database. And in parallel, we have a, an asynchronous plotting utility, which every so often uh, grabs the data from the SQL, <coughs> uses a port into GNU plot, creates the, the, the plots, and writes the binary PNG data, also straight into Nisia. Finally, we patched it all together using WebTool, and we serve the HTML uh, also straight from Nisia. Uh, we cache it, so if, if, if a user requests the web page and we think that the version in the cache is too old, we create a new version. Um, this application was sort of about 3,000 lines of code, and it got us well in the way with uh, OTP. We used uh, supervisors, gen servers, um, and we experimented a bit more with a real distributed system. And uh, the, um, I must say that the uh, transactions in Mnesia and the uh, man I don't care what you store in there mentality are absolutely brilliant. But the big upshot of this was that we got the green light to actually do the real thing. So, so back to the Uniboard. This is a schematic overview of the Uniboard. And you see the FPGAs, and each FPGA will have a tiny CPU running on it. If we zoom in a bit on the FPGA, we see our VHDL engineers will implement the actual application modules. They will do the uh, work that we want to be done, the signal processing. Typically, these modules will have command and control registers. But now what we'll do is we'll take these and we memory map them into the CPU's memory map so that we can make them available via the onboard gigabit ethernet. So the basic idea for communication is that a client program on the control computer uh, communicates with a server program running on the uh, tiny CPU on the FPJ. <coughs> for that effect, we developed a simple binary protocol which allows us to read values from or store values into or update values in the CPU's memory map. And as for the programming model, we decided to, we looked closely at the hardware documentation that our VHDL engineers had to deal with. So what, what do you typically find in this documentation? You'll find addresses, you'll find uh, bit fields, and you'll find uh, a description of what they actually mean for these fields too. So we did come up with an FPGA client library where one controller controls one specific FPGA and each controller keeps a register map and the register map does nothing but mapping a symbolic name to a typed quantity somewhere in the memory map of the FPGA. So what kind of types, data types can you have? You can, for example, address a single bit inside a 32-bit word, or you can address a, a consecutive range of bits in a word, uh, a single 32-bit word, or a consecutive block of 32-bit words. Then we define simple primitive operations in the library. Uh, that is operate on the symbolic names only, and the library will actually translate these commands into the binary protocol, taking care and uh, using appropriate bit masks such that bits outside of the range of interest are not um, affected. Because, uh, so how, how does this look in practice? Uh, we've developed a behavior uh, called a personality, forcing a module to export uh, a function registers which is actually, which returns the list of registers defined for that specific FPJ. So in this example, we have a single, uh, we have a bit range of five bits called num tap. We have uh, a single bit called PPS enable, and we have a, 
uh, control status word somewhere in the memory. You should uh, you note that the bit range and the bit are different fields inside the same physical address. And then if we look, for example, into the documentation, the uh, engineers have documented how you would actually start a filter. And they could, uh, maybe they said that, well, you first have to disable the GPS by writing a zero to that bit. Then you need to read the control status register, do something with it. Finally, you can update the num tap bit range and re-enable the PPS. So we think that this maps pretty closely of what you would find in hardware documentation. Um, one property is that uh, hardware typically responds erroneously if you start overwriting bits that you shouldn't. Uh, so if, if you would try to write, if you do not take appropriate countermeasures and you start uh, writing the value of 2 to the PPS bit, then you might have uh, undesired results. So the FPJ client library crashes hard, really hard, if you try to write the value of 2 to the PPS enable, because we defined it as a single bit, and the value of 2 is absolutely not going to fit in there. And this is a sign that you're doing something really wrong, and you'd better go look and find out why this is happening, because it shouldn't. And besides doing a single FPJ, we're actually building a full-fledged uh, correlator control system. So uh, we've built a module on top of the single FPJ control that controls all eight FPJs in parallel. Uh, we've used YAC to uh, generate parsers and validate them for uh, configuration files. We're reading several binary data formats <laughs> and sending their contents over UDP. Uh, we're capturing uh, the output data from the, from the board and writing it to file. And in our experience, that if the VHDL engineers have come up with some new functionality, which usually takes at least two weeks, we can typically support it within a day. Uh, we also make quite heavy use of the distributed nature, nature of Erlang. Uh, we run Erlang on the nodes that send data into the correlator. Uh, we run Erlang at a node that catches the output and writes it to disk. And we have a central uh, command and control node which uh, drives, configures and controls the hardware and orchestrates all components in the system. Um, there's a lot of good things to be said about Erlang. Uh, I think that the uh, conciseness, uh, the, the high productivity of the language, combined with the unignorability of errors, is really a big plus. And as I say in the sheet, the binary pattern matching is um, something that every language should be jealous of. Unfortunately, when there is good things, there's also bad things. And I think what in our case is really uh, bad is that our engineers typically struggle with the language. And even though the language itself is very simple, they seem to struggle more with the concepts. How do you actually achieve anything in a functional language? How do you do stuff? That is what's making, uh, making it difficult for them. And the conciseness or the brevity of the code uh, also works against you if you have people in your team that are less proficient in the language and it's really difficult for them to read uh, somebody else's code. And the, we found that we are building a distributed system and it's, complete, it's in development and it's, we haven't found a good way to make it uh, easily deployable at least that it's easy to use for a non-expert uh, Erlang program. And actually that's all I have to say. I'd like to thank you for your attention. <laughs> Questions? Yes. Um, I just wondered what your reasons behind choosing uh, MySQL. 
Um, the question was, why do we use MySQL as, your, as our DBMS? Uh, primarily, that's because we have, uh, as you see, we use a lot of different programming languages, and MySQL is very easy to connect to from all of those languages. So. Yeah, and, but we already had uh, MySQL running so for a couple of years, so this was just... <laughs> I told my boss we should change the password so he didn't even laugh. <laughs> yeah, no, no. How many do you have in a single license? Um, we can, there can be up to 32 uniboards into a single system. And then you run out of uh, unique node IDs. But you're, it's possible to have several racks next to each other. As but you have to, uh, each system of up to 32 uniboards, you have to uh, yeah, treat them as one. <laughs> yes. So it's uh, 256 FPGAs in total. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's a great job, thank you. Um, uh, so the Erlang was running on the uniboards, right? No, no. The, oh, okay. uh, the CPU is running in 14 kilobytes of memory. So. Okay. There's not good, no chance of going to run that alone. Okay. Okay. So and you didn't think about like embedding uh, like uh, ARM chips or something on the uniboard and then running Linux on top of that. Um, so the question, the question is, uh, should we run uh, uh, have an extra processor on the uniboard uh, and run a, a full-fledged Linux system on there? Actually, that is very high on my wish list, and we've started thinking about the next version of this hardware. And it is one of the things that is currently being discussed. And <coughs> the codes are not up yet, uh, because there's a few people who want it, and also about the same amount of people who don't think it's a good idea, mostly because of the power budget. We want to be as low power as possible. So. Omar. Talking about the power budget, have you looked at other architectures such as the Epiphany, which has really low power risk cores coupled with a tool core or ARM processor? Uh, they did run a quick Kickstarter campaign quite recently, and their aim is lowest power possible for a game workflow. So, um, okay, so. Maybe we should put up a beer after Okay, yeah. Uh, okay, so there are other uh, competing architectures uh, that's being mentioned. And one of the things that uh, the, the reason behind this design is we really wanted to concentrate as much processing power as is possible without actually melting the board. So that was the basic design criteria. Okay.